Welcome to Community Conversation. I'm George Messier. I'm sitting with David Gesser, commander of American Legion Post 187 in Washington, Connecticut, and we're talking about veterans programs and veterans benefits. I serve as the director of the Meriden and Wallingford Veterans Service Center here in, in Wallingford to assist veterans and in particular family members to uh, realize and recognize and obtain the benefits that the, they are entitled to on the strength of the veteran service. What we hope to accomplish today is to discuss some of the things, the fundamentals of veterans benefits to better enable post commanders like Dave and his, his counterparts to uh, inform veterans of what they're entitled to what they're, uh, and what's required to obtain those benefits. So what I thought I'd do, Dave, is, is start with the uh, discussion about something, the, the most basic uh, document or credential that a veteran has and that's the DD-214. Okay. Uh, Defense Department uh, Document 214. In my parlance, uh, as important as a passport. Uh, a passport is essential for both uh, at, the, at the destination and in return. A DD-214 has that much importance to a veteran with regard to accessing the VA system for veterans' benefit. It opens the doors. You are right, it does. It's a document that every veteran receives when they leave the service. They may have lost it, misplaced it, it may have been stolen, lost in a fire or in a move or something of that nature. It can be uh, recovered from other outside sources, but it is the license or the passport to veterans' benefits. My concern, based upon what I'm seeing in my office, is that a lot of the family members, the spouses, widows if that's the case, family members, uh, uh, adult sons and daughters, who may be powers of attorney, conservators of the, uh, of the veterans' affairs, uh, the executor of an estate, they're unfamiliar with the documents because they have no exposure to military life. Good point. In so many cases, as you know from your experience, the veterans came home from the war, they put the paperwork, the uniforms away someplace, didn't want to talk about it, and they didn't go there. DD-214 might be hiding in the bottom drawer. And all too often, <laughs> you're right. <laughs> or up in the attic. In the attic. <laughs> and they don't want to talk about it, they, don't, they, they, they put those memories away, uh, good and bad, and they don't really want to discuss it. So in so many cases where the veteran is, is, uh, has either passed or he's incapacitated for some reason, if the spouse doesn't know about those things, if the, if the adult children who themselves were not in the military don't know about those things, it poses a challenge to the family and at, at precisely the wrong time in that veteran's life, in and the family's life. And of course those offspring could be out of the house for many, many years prior You're, to that person having a physical problem. Good point. Not only are they out of the house, but in so many cases they're across the country. Across they're, the living, country. they're living, I spoke with someone today who's in Oregon, yeah. uh, someone else is in Tennessee. So those kinds of things, yeah. where do we retrieve those documents? Yeah. There are secondary sources to obtain those documents and recover those things, but it's, the, the important thing to note is that uh, a photo album from one's military experience, small ID card that the, that the individual retained when they left the service, a copy of their orders from point A to point B, all of that is, is interesting but immaterial. The, the, the passport key, if you will, as you pointed out, is the DD-214. And the only exception to that uh, is for veterans who actually go all the way back to World War II. And the reason for that, at that time, the Defense Department as such did not exist. But the War Department issued a document, uh, and so in very fine print, and it's always at the lower left-hand corner of that document, at the bottom, it'll, in very fine print, It'll say WDAGO, War Department Adjutant General's Office. Okay. And for those veterans, World War II period, that's the document that their unit, their ship, their battalion, their regiment, their squadron, that's the document that they had on the shelf when the war ended or when that individual left the service. That's the document they provided. Other units may have had the DD-214, which is just coming out. So they're both acceptable. They're both legitimate. I heard a while back that there was a fire out at some record center that... Uh the government had and some of the records might have been destroyed. What if somebody and you heard correctly is in that Excellent situation? Question. When a veteran or service member leaves the service, that individual does not retain his record file from his military service. The doc the entire file is, is bundled up and sent off to the National Personnel Record Center in St. Louis, Missouri for safekeeping. And I'm, and usually that you use the term loosely. I right? use <laughs> Things happen. For lead and, safekeeping. And in 1973, there was a massive fire at the National Personal Records Center, and millions of records pertaining to Army and Army Air Force slash Air Force individuals who served between the years 1912 and 1960. Millions of those records were destroyed in that fire or so badly damaged that they were virtually mm -hmm. unusable. Obviously, the problem was that at that time, there were no copies made. It wasn't, they didn't make a second copy for safekeeping somewhere else. Mm -hmm. No Xeroxes, no CDs, nothing of that nature. It was the one and only master file. 
So in so many cases since 19, that 1973 fire, it has been a challenge to, to validate one's service and to reconstruct or, or recall those, the, mater the information which may have been helpful in, in securing VA benefits uh, in a timely manner. Okay. That has been an impediment and the services and the National Personal Record Center have gone to, to great lengths to recover from that problem, but it, 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 has, it does remain a challenge for the, for, for okay. the older veterans. So, so you're exactly right. But the ones that can find their records and need benefit, lots of conversations nationally about the VA. I, I have to say, uh, from what I've heard from people that are in my Legion post that have gone to the VA in West Haven, they tell me they have received excellent treatment, very professional, very prompt, and they're, they're very pleased about that. But for, for somebody that uh, hasn't been through the experience yet and is having medical issues, What's the first thing they have to do? Uh, make an appointment to see George? Uh, because, you know, it's, it's a government agency, and it's like, where do you go? What door do you knock on? Who do you talk to? Thanks for mentioning the VA. Again, we're in Connecticut. We've been very fortunate here in Connecticut. Most of my conversations with veterans are one-on-one -on -one conversations, and not entirely without exception, but for the most part, the veterans are very pleased with the, ser with the care and service that they get from the VA here in Connecticut, and that's always an, it's gratifying to hear. It bears mentioning that neither one of us is employed by the VA. We're not, this <laughs> this no, is not a paid, no, paid no, announcement, no. but uh, it, it's, been, it's been good. So the veteran knows that uh, the VA here in Connecticut has a regional office uh, in Newington. It also has a, a, a lower case, if you will, hospital facility in, in uh, outpatient care facility in Newington, and it has the main facility in West Haven. If the veteran has never applied to the VA and never before enrolled in the VA system, then he can simply p go to Newington or go to West Haven. He'd want to bring that DD-214. Okay. Uh, he'd want to bring, uh, in some cases, his last year's tax filing because depending upon the circumstances, that may or may not be a decision point in enrolling that individual in the VA. Okay. So let's explore that. If a veteran has a service-connected ailment or condition, that person is probably already, is already in the VA system because he has made a claim against the VA uh, owing to a condition that he suffered uh, in, uh, or suffers from going back to military service. He may have fallen down a ship's ladder aboard ship. He may have fallen off the back of a truck, whatever, but that individual has a service-connected condition. And if he, uh, if, so he has pressed a claim with the VA and, and so been admitted into the system. If that's not the case, if, it's, if he's just a question of advanced age, he may want to enroll in the VA health care system for any number of reasons. He can do that in person. He can fill out a VA 1010-EZ, which is a, very, a fairly simple form, uh, and submit that and along with a copy of uh, the, the mail. He can e even enroll online if he has the, the uh, access to do that. So there's a number of different ways to enroll in the VA healthcare system. When one accomplishes that, that individual receives a VA uh, healthcare card with his photo or her photo, either one, his or her photo on it. They will schedule that individual for a medical exam uh, and thereby en en enroll and enlist that person into the system. They will access his medical records from St. Louis, Missouri. They'll obtain his medical file as a data set to start from. And then the individual can come in with his prescriptions uh, records, his, uh, any medical records he wants to present from his private care physician. You, you mentioned Newington and you mentioned the, the main hospital in West Haven. You want to touch base on the facility up in Rocky Hill? There's a big, Excellent point. Thank big you. veterans place up there. Every state has a veteran system at the state level, which is, if you want to think of it this way, the little brother to the big brother. Yep. The, the federal government's VA system is the big brother. Here in Connecticut, we have the, the uh, state of Connecticut Department of Veterans Affairs uh, headquartered at Rocky Hill. So, but they can, they can enroll in the federal system through Rocky Hill if they wanted to. But, but Rocky Hill is a different much different function than West Haven, right? It is. Yeah, yeah. Rocky Hill is, is a different facility, and it, again, it, it, is, a it, is a state of Connecticut, it is a state of Connecticut facility and separate from and the, and the federal government. And people, veterans, can live there for a number of years. That's uh, correct. They their, can reside there. Depending on their medical condition, their age, that type of thing. That is correct. Whereas the VA hospital, they come in, they're treated, and might stay a short term, but it's not, they're not there for years at the VA hospital. You are right. Okay. Two things that I'd like you to touch base, and I know you have a book over there that's that's 900 pages long. And, 2,000. Uh, 2,000 pages. Well, well, let me talk about these. You, 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 can ahead, you want, to, want to tell me what's in that book? No. No. <laughs> let me talk about these. The Short first, version. The first one is, is a 
a document or a publication put out by the Department of Veteran, Veterans Affairs itself. I think when, nowadays when one enrolls in the VA system, they provide the veteran with this booklet. It's a, it's a pretty good book, 200 uh, or so pages, and it's a really good primer, an outline of VA programs and benefits and how to access some of those things. It's a good starting point. It really is. No. I'm going to put that one aside. No. Do you, do you have those in your office I if have, somebody wanted I, one? No, or? I do not. I do not have copies in my office. One can, one can uh, write to the governor printing office, and for $5, they will, they will uh, provide you a copy with one. You'll let somebody know what, what to I ask about for. I've got, I have a form in the back of the booklet to do that. Okay, great. The second booklet that I use is Veteran Benefits, entitled, subtitled What Every Veteran Should Know. And it is a more comprehensive, more detailed book, which outlines in greater detail and in greater depth the, the programs that, that are offered by the, the, the VA, the Federal Government's Department of Veterans Affairs, for veterans, both wartime and peacetime veterans. And here again, it's important to make, the system makes that distinction in a lot of regards, but the, the veterans who served on active duty in the military, be it peacetime or wartime, are eligible for virtually all the same benefits. There are a couple of exceptions. So this is, I use this book on my desk all the time because it, because it is more comprehensive and more detailed and, and uh, useful in that regard. I did bring a third book. I knew we were going to get to this we one. To get to this I book. knew we were going to get to this. This is entitled The Veterans Benefit Manual. The George's Bible. <laughs> well, not exactly. Uh, this is actually put out by the National Veterans Legal Services Program, which is a group, a nationwide group of attorneys, most of, many of whom, at least, who have military service themselves. And since 1991, they have produced this, this document every single no year. No wonder it's 2,000 pages long. Oh. Au contraire, mon ami. This book is in fa there is actually this is one half of a two volume set. Okay. The second book is just as large as this, another two thousand pages. I just didn't have the strength to carry them both. <laughs> but this presents in much greater detail an uh, analysis of veterans' benefits and the, the ins and outs of applying for those benefits okay. and so forth. And, and it also addresses case law in many and cases. And obviously the legalities. The, thank you. It, it, the legalities and case law, which in many cases has overturned the VA's position on so many things as, as, uh, as major, if you will, as uh, Agent Orange issues dating back to the Vietnam War. So you'll know this comes out every year. I only use it every two years. As the, the, uh, I have obtained the newer editions, I've made these books available to the different posts in the area uh, to include your post and to include a, a post or two in Meriden and another post here in Wallingford. So they have, it, even though they're a little out of date, they have a, a really good, it's a really good starting point if they want to delve deeply into some of these things. So these manuals are available and they're, they're just resource documents that I use on a regular basis. Yeah, and, and each post, the VFW and Legion has a service officer who is nowhere near as thorough in their knowledge of it as you are, but they can help people get to different resources Absolutely. and, and Absolutely. help get them to you to open some more doors. And I'm going to come back to the point that I started out with. It's the family members who don't have any insights into this at all. And it may be as something as fundamental, how do I obtain a DD-214? I can't find it in a household and so forth. It may be on file in the town clerk's office because if it's a wartime veteran, the veteran receives, is eligible for a property tax break from the community that he or she lives in. But in order to obtain that property tax break, the veteran has to pr uh, produce it and, and provide the town clerk, let them make a copy of it. And that stays on file forever. It doesn't go away when the veteran leaves town and so forth. It stays on file there. It's always there. So that's one possibility. Another possibility is if they lived in another town before they came to our town, then they may have filed it there. Since roughly the mid-1980s, when a, a, a service member leaves active duty, the, of course the record book goes to the National Personnel Records Center, but the state of record, in our case Connecticut, the S Department of Veterans Affairs in Connecticut receives a copy of that individual's DD-214. Okay, so, so, if, so if the individual can't locate his or her DD-214, State of Connecticut Department of Veterans Affairs is a possibility. Also, My office, uh, the Veteran Service Center for Meriden and Wallingford, is not an official repository of DD-214. No. I have thousands of them on file because those veterans have done business with my office in one form or for one reason or another. But the, uh, the town clerks in, 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 in our towns and in cities throughout the, the, the state and the country may have a copy of that DD-214 on but file. But you can direct them where to look and give them exactly. some clues. Exactly. And if all else fails, then we go to the National Personnel Records mm -hmm. Center to find that document. At the very other end of the spectrum is when it comes to the veteran just passed away 
uh, what is the veteran entitled to? Well, there may be burial benefits uh, available to that individual. One of them, of course, is, is burial, in our case, at a, st a state veteran cemetery here in Connecticut or a national veteran cemetery, depending on the particulars. There may be some financial assistance available to the veteran or to the, to the surviving family members for that burial, not necessarily so. And that's worth mentioning. There may be a misconception out there that, well, he was a veteran or she was a veteran, the, 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 the VA will pay for the burial. That's not entirely true at all. Yeah. There, are, there are cases, there are certainly uh, cases where it is true, other cases where it's not. So it's important for them to, to, to draw the distinction. Does a, does a funeral home uh, usually have any information or have information that they can provide to the family as far as veterans' benefits, seeing as they may deal with that on a regular basis? Funeral homes, for example, in our state are very conversant with, with uh, obtaining access, for example, to the uh, Veterans Cemetery here in Connecticut. And they are expert at securing copies of the DD-214, here again, that critical document, from the town clerk's offices, uh, wherever that may be. But they're typically going to redirect that person uh, after they deal with the, 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 the matter of burial, if, if, if it's, uh, the goal is burial at the Veterans Cemetery, for other benefits, cash, money benefits and so forth, they'll direct them, for example, here to my office. And let's explore that a little bit. About three or four years ago, the state of Connecticut enacted legislation whereby every community has to have a contact person on the payroll, if you will, within that community, who is the contact person at least to redirect the individual to the right authorities or right agencies to access veterans' benefits. I'm happy to say, we're proud to say that my office has been in existence for 70 years uh, since the end of World War II and uh, jointly su supported by, by the two towns. That's not the case in, in, in most communities. Since uh, three or four years ago, every community is required to have a contact person. That's a really good thing so that the challenge is to disseminate that information. Hopefully something like this does that for us. Yeah, especially in small towns, they've got a selectman and there's five or five, six thousand people. There's nobody. They may not Their be. staff is very limited. So uh, yep, you're right. it's, it's nice they got somebody. Uh, and, you know, we'll give the legislature credit for that one. One thing I've noticed, I, I give one statement and then i got a question for you. I've, I've noticed that some funerals I've seen in the past several years, I see the Army, Navy, or Air Force logo on, on the side of a hearse. It's a, it's a veteran that's passed. So, oh. That's a very nice gesture on their part. Yeah. I have a pet peeve, not with you, but, and, and it doesn't affect me, but it, it, it's affected people that I know. And, and that's this whole thing with Agent Orange. Uh, there's been an awful lot of people affected by it. And I know there's been some changes in the rulings, and for a while the government said, no, you don't qualify. And there's been some adjustments to that. And from what I hear, over 50% of the, and I don't know if the figure is right, but over 50% of those people that served in Vietnam have now passed. And a lot of it is certainly Agent Orange, but tell me what's happening with the Agent Orange and, and how they how they define it or qualify or... Okay. If my question's out of line, tell me that too. Here again, I think most veterans understand what know what Agent Orange is, even if they weren't in the Vietnam conflict. Agent Orange was a chemical used to defoliate the jungle to make it easier to, to locate and, and identify and target uh, enemy uh, combatants. The, the challenge was that uh, Agent Orange is, is lethal to human beings as well as to vegetation, and so uh, there are a lot of casualties which, which uh, derive from that source. For too many years after the war, the, the federal government, the VA, denied those claims and said, no, Agent Orange is not a factor. So a lot of, of good, decent soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines passed away from exposure to Agent Orange, but their claims were denied. That entire situation was fought over for, for decades, and probably in the, in the mid to late 90s, uh, they, they came to an entirely different solution, and they said, you know, the medical science tells us that a host of ailments it can be attributed to Agent Orange. Including so Parkinson's and Parkinson's, a whole lot of things. Parkinson's, uh, ischemic heart disease, diabetes, heart and, and other things. The federal government did a 180 on that and said, if the veteran served in Vietnam, boots on the ground in Vietnam, that veteran is deemed to have been exposed to Agent Orange. So if the veteran in later years manifests uh, symptoms or ailments that, we, that science tells us can be triggered by Agent Orange, 
The benefit of the doubt today goes to the veteran. Step in the right direction. Sadly, too late for a whole lot of veterans, yeah. which, which, if I may, I'm going to bring up something. Um, and I didn't know this until a couple of years ago. There is an effort by the Vietnam Veterans uh, Memorial Fund to recognize veterans who served in Vietnam who passed away from ailments associated with the Vietnam conflict but whose name can't appear in a wall. Yeah. But they have found another way to recognize those veterans. And so every year they have a ceremony in Washington to recognize veterans of the Vietnam conflict who died from those ailments. And they have a, a way of to, to memorialize those electronically for posterity. Mm -hmm. So there's, they had a ceremony each year at Washington. And I only learned about this a couple of years ago because one of the veterans in, Washington, in, uh, in our town passed away. And their family came back from that observance, and I was, how nice it, that it took place, how nice that they, they informed me so I can pass that on. So, yeah. so they, weren't, they weren't killed in combat, but... Uh, yes, no, they, they survived the war, they survived but they passed the war. away years later from Agent and Orange related yeah. uh, ailments. Let me, yeah. let me throw another one at you. I have a, a very good friend that served in Vietnam, but he, he wasn't in Vietnam. He spent a lot of time over the border. Served uh, a lot of time in training people in Cambodia and doing that type of thing. Of course, we weren't there. That's right. So we weren't. What about that, his? That's, what, that matter has been resolved. What about his medical records? It's like that he was never there. That matter has been resolved has in it? the veterans' favor now, whereby Agent Orange-related ailments and conditions, is, it's now recognized to, to, en to encompass more than Vietnam, but to the contiguous countries where we may or may not have operated, shall we say. <laughs> we may or may we not may have, have operated, okay. yeah. Uh, it bears <laughs> mentioning that there remains, that there, in fact, talk about this a little bit more because this may trigger questions at your post. They make a distinction between brown water navy and blue water navy. Brown water navy are sailors who served on fast boats, for example, river patrol and things of that nature. Those veterans, those sailors are deemed to have been in Vietnam and so are entitled to VA benefits that arising from uh, conditions brought on by Agent Orange. Okay. Blue water sailors are those who served offshore and, and maybe a, a mile or two offshore and maybe 50 or 100 miles offshore on carriers groups, for example. The federal government, the VA, does not recognize those same, ail uh, same ailments uh, f from blue water sailors. That issue is being litigated and being fought tooth and nail by, by both sides. Mm. Don't, there's no solution in sight that I'm aware of. Yeah. Interestingly enough, a very small number of veterans who are in the Air National Guard, for example, or in the Air Force, and in, in years after the Vietnam War, they worked on or serviced aircraft that were used to disperse Agent Orange, and those aircraft were not properly uh, cleaned and so forth after the So they may have uh, encountered Agent Orange residue and been exposed and thereby contracted those ailments. They're starting to recognize that. So each yeah. the chapter is being rewritten every year, and that's why I keep that those <laughs> manuals at my desk. Yeah, I have heard that, that, that some of the the sailors that were taking care of the airplanes, loading uh, the bombs on them with the yep. Agent Orange in them, and the airplanes have got, you know, contamination on them. And so it's a question of does it apply to some of them because some of them are coming down with some of the same ailments exactly. that are related to so Agent that, Orange. So, and the National Veterans Legal Services Program, and I'm not championing them, but they deserve to be championed. I should uh, because they have done uh, yeoman service in taking these cases to court and fighting the VA or the, and the federal government where they, the government has resisted those things. So that's a, that's a good case. Yeah. Sometimes when it comes to paying out money, the government's too quick to say yes and or too slow well, to say yes in some cases. And Let me shift gears a little bit. There is a program under the VA for wartime veterans. And this may be of interest to some of your older veterans who emerged from their conflicts in good health but now the ravages of old age have taken, have taken hold. Non-service connected pension is a VA program and it can provide some financial assistance to the veteran or the veteran's family, if that's the case, if they're caring for an aged veteran, uh, in meeting the cost of aid and attendance in the veteran's home, if that's the case, or in an uh, apartment or a retirement home, and ultimately in a nursing home, if that were the case non-service connected pension program which can provide some financial assistance uh, for, uh, to meet the costs associated with aid and attendance. It's uh, means tested, which is to say they're going to look at the family's mm -hmm. financial situation. It's a program that's not really well known outside of the VA cir veteran mm -hmm. circles because when people leave the service they tend to think of the GI Bill or the, or the modern day equivalent mm -hmm. of the GI Bill for college. They tend to think of VA home loans but they never think about the other part the, the, uh, later years, 
And so uh, by the time the, as the years go by, they don't even know that mm -hmm. this thing exists. And so, those can be very costly, um, going into a nursing home or that type of thing. Uh, they can be very expensive. So if it there's, is. there's an alternative where they can help get some funding for that. They can get some great. funding. And the program, mm -hmm. uh, if it comes to that where the veteran, I tend to think of this program as a stepping stone between no care required uh, and more aggressive care required to conceivably t uh, Medicaid or Title 19. This program is something of a stepping stone between the two. In fact, if it, if it reaches that point, they run in tandem. Uh, the, the VA program can run in tandem with Title 19. The VA, in a manner of speaking, pays first, uh, which enabling the state's Medicaid system to husband their dollars, and they will come in with the balance of funding if it's a nursing home situation. Complicated, convoluted, uh, a bit of a cumbersome program to apply for, uh, and I can't pretend otherwise, uh, hence the, the utility, if you will, of the office that I chair. To, to, accommodate, to assist veterans in navigating the labyrinth and uh, accessing the benefits. Of Another interesting question that comes up sometimes is uh, the difference between, you know, reserve and guard. I mean, one's, okay. one's state and one's national, but uh, they're treated differently as far as veterans' benefits and those types of things. Is that Let me give you, correct? You're right. You are spot on. Let me give you a little background, and that's from my personal experience. When I went to uh, Paris Island in 1966, boot camp and all that experience, and we graduated, and virtually everyone in the platoon received a National Defense Service uh, ribbon to yep. wear in the uniform, recognizing that they were serving during a, a conflict. And there were three individuals in the platoon who didn't get one when we graduated. And so I asked the, the drill instructor, I said, you know and he said to me, those are reservists because they're not on active duty. They're not entitled to wear a National Defense Service ribbon. And I'd never thought of anything more about it than that. It, it, was, it escaped my memory and didn't think about it. Years later, come to, to realize that the federal government does not see members of the National Guard or even the reserves as veterans unless and until those individuals are called up for federal service and perform, do a stint of service, for example, in Iraq or Afghanistan. So someone who's in the National Guard is not a veteran because their service time, their training time, wait, boot camp. Wait, wait a second. Hang on, let me, let me finish. Let me, not, a, not a veteran by somebody's definition. No, by the federal government's definition. Yeah. By the federal government's definition. That's not some, just, just somebody. That's federal law. Yeah. A an individual who is in the National Guard is not a veteran unless and until one of two things happens, primarily one of two things. Either the individual is called up under Title 10 of the U.S. Code for service in a conflict and completes that service, or uh, the individual is actually injured in the course of active duty for training and suddenly becomes a patient, if you will, at the VA, in the VA system. But a member of the National Guard who, whose service is limited to active duty for training and then weekend drills and two weeks in the summer, none of that is considered active duty. And so that individual is, in fact, not even entitled to a foot marker at the grave because that individual, by, uh, under those strictures that I've defined, is, is not a veteran. If the individual, his, he or, or she or the unit, is called up by the governor of the state for a flood disaster or some other natural disaster, hurricane or something of that nature, that's not being called up by the federal government. That's being called up by the governor of the state. That's not federal service. There is confusion and there are some broken noses about that, and I respect that and I understand that, but that is federal law. Federal government's yeah. position we that dictates, you a veteran. That dictates the, the, the yeah. programs and benefits that yeah. I can uh, assist. Right. But I don't want anybody that's watching I to get you. the idea I got you. that Reserve and National Guard aren't going to be you. recognized on Veterans Day. We will recognize them. Dave, I want to thank you so much for, for making yourself available to, uh, and to have this conversation. You're I hope it's welcome. a value to you and, your, and the veterans in your posts sure. and other posts, uh, our community and veterans, whoever might see this. Very good. We and the family members. We appreciate you uh, providing the information, and we're always happy to call on you. Thank you, sir. Thank you.